Hi there, and welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hello there, welcome to episode 99 of the 1% Better Podcast. And for me, this is the first real episode of season three. Last week's intro show, launch show, whatever you want to call it show, was just probably me talking most of the time. I give some snippets of the first four interviews, but it's uh, me just laying things out for the season ahead and what's been going on behind the scenes and reflecting on the journey. But do check it out if you haven't listened to it. It'll give you a good overview of what's going on. But this one is the first interview, and it's one that I've recorded a few months ago with uh, Neil Fenn. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So just to reflect back a little, uh, at the weekend, I gave a talk about podcasting to a master's marketing group in CIT. Thanks to Stephen Ryan for the invite. Really enjoyed it. The more you talk about the journey you've been on and the more you share what you've learned, uh, hopefully others are getting use from it. But I also learn a lot myself and especially talking to folks in the marketing world. One of the things I think that I have had zero real experience in prior to doing all of this was marketing. But I've learned a lot and continue to do so. So talking to those guys and getting them some insights there is great. During the conversation, I talked about the iTunes charts and how you can fluctuate up and down that and also how although it is of value and the main value i see of it is when you have a high ranking random people might find your show that wouldn't typically and that's the key thing for me if folks can find the show that don't know anything about it don't know anything about me and stumble over it and learn something from the episodes that's the perfect scenario or the best scenario i'm most conscious of using the word perfect but other times you can see podcasts up there that may not be releasing and there is a whole dark side to the iTunes charts, I believe, uh, called Gaming the Charts. So I talked a bit about that, just it's an eye-opener. I've learned a lot about that over the last while. But when I came home that evening, probably on the back of some new listeners subscribing, the podcast was up to number six in the iTunes education charts, which is great. It was great to see that. It fluctuated between six and seven for about a day or so. And then weirdly, on, on Sunday morning, the 864 podcast was in the top 20 as well, which is one that I haven't been marketing as much, given that now it's mostly behind Patreon and new episodes will be there. A few people must have subscribed to the four or five shows that are still out there. So that's all really good. It's great to see the podcast up there. Hopefully new folks checking it out and doing talks and presentations about the journey is really the probably best platform to get the broader reach out there hopefully doing a few more in the near future certainly in the area of leadership i've learned a lot around leadership from interviews over the last while and i'm putting together some pieces on that so looking forward to sharing that in the near future i did talk a bit about advertising the show and how to get it out there a little bit better with that group as well and we talked about patreon i know last week on the intro show i mentioned the new patreon setup so if you haven't checked that out please do so if you want to get early access to the one percent better podcast episodes and access to all the 864 and other stuff it's there it's something you can subscribe to so check that out there's a link to the patreon page on the rob of the green that website as well so that was it a good weekend a good launch weekend and again moving forward now looking forward to seeing how this episode goes down so this one was with neil fenn i recorded it uh, around christmas time just before christmas actually and had always planned to put it out in the early part of season three to kind of coincide with the start of the football league of ireland season that ties in with neil as he is the manager of longford town me being from longford town it was a pleasure to chat with neil he's also had a very good career in the professional game He started it with Tottenham Hotspurs, and although I'm an Arsenal fan, I didn't let that interfere with the interview. Learned a lot about his journey there, and then he took his career to Ireland a number of years later, where he had a lot of success, most notably with Cork City. So when I approached him, now being the manager of Longford Town, I had the unique opportunity to chat to him, and with the podcast as the platform, he was very keen to talk through his story. To be fair, he was very good with his time. It was a busy time at at the the time of recording but i think you'll enjoy listening to it as he talks about talent self-belief the challenges of the professional game when things aren't working out 
but also then we talk a bit about management and leadership and that's really some of the core themes coming out of this one that you could take something from that's probably enough of a ramble for this week if you do enjoy the podcast please do subscribe and subscribing helps me keep that ranking up the itunes charts getting into the ears of more people and not paying for it in a disingenuous and inauthentic way so subscribe and tell folks you know if they would like to subscribe that would be great as well it's all about sharing it's all about helping others grow and hopefully having fun while we do it and next week's episode just as a taster will be the interview on leadership and a lot more besides with ma anand sheila from the documentary wild wild country the rajneesh bagwan commune from the 80s check it out it's a netflix show but looking forward to sharing that one as well that's it on to the chat with neil fenn thanks good luck hey folks welcome to another episode of the one percent better podcast and for this one it's a it's kind of a, a treat for me in that i'm talking to to somebody that is um linked to my hometown at this point uh and also in the the world of football or, or soccer uh, for those that are listening from the us um i'm, I'm delighted to introduce neil fain to the to the podcast neil welcome to the show hi rob thanks for having me on great to connect i know we're connecting on a build up to christmas early morning so um i know we're, we're both probably squeezing this one in uh but i appreciate you taking the time out to, to chat no problem no problem i've just been getting a few last minute presents online this morning so um got a little bit of time now very good you, you you're ahead of the game so maybe that says a lot about your ability to be prepared and things like that we'll dive into into that maybe whole uh, realm as well so neil uh, obviously tracking your career as a manager with longford town and um, being a longford person living in cork um from afar seeing the, the progress you're making um when i was doing the research for for this episode i was reading some of your i suppose interviews in the past and i think it, it appears that management wasn't something maybe that was on your radar from uh, from the early days. W- would, would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think like, you can, as a player, you can always see or you always feel that there are there are players in your squad or in your team that are taking an interest in the kind of tactics or taking a big interest in what the manager's saying. And you always think that they're probably going to go in and be a manager or go into coaching. I wasn't like that. I used to... I used to get bored a lot when when the managers and that were talking about tactics and and, and stuff like that and standing around on pitches. Um, so it wasn't until I suppose I got towards the end of my career um, I started to just do my coaching badges like everybody else does, probably just in case. And um, even then, I, I it was it was I retired in 2010, and it was kind of 2017 before I actually became an assistant manager in England with Leighton Orient so it was that long out of professional football really hmm. and and with that six I, I read a six game stint that was with, with Leighton Orient you were kind of assistant manager to um, Omar Riza it was probably a friend of yours was he? Yeah we grew up we grew up on the same road in, in London and he would have played for he would have played for Arsenal West Ham Cambridge um, and then he's, he's, he's from Tur- he's Turkish origin, so he ended up playing in Turkey. Um, so kind of a similar career to mine. I would have been at Tottenham um, and then Peterborough, and then, and then went to and then came to Ireland, which is where my mum's from. So a similar similar kind of um, playing career. And he he was he was at Leighton Orient um, working with the under 18s and they were going through managers at the time. They had a chairman who was a little bit a little bit. Um, quick to fire people so um he ended up getting the job they were already kind of going getting relegated there was a, there was an extremely slim chance that they could have stayed up and he just he, he got the first team job and said to me do you want to come over so it, it was a little bit of thinking about with you know there's a lot a lot i know it was only for a couple of months so uh, we ended up i ended up going and, and really really enjoyed it Mm. And uh, just full disclosure, I'm an Arsenal fan as well. So Omar is probably somebody I'd probably love to talk to down the road. Uh, I know you're probably with the, the the background in Spurs. We we'll park all of that for the moment. Um, yeah. But you, you went into a, an environment there that was in crisis almost uh, from from what I read. Um, 
was what is it about I suppose that kind of environment that you really enjoyed did you did you kind of lean in towards that in of chaos or, or was there something that created a buzz around that I suppose it, it was just a case of maybe expectation nobody was expecting us to do anything so a, any result we got any win we got because they had gone on such a bad losing streak so any draw we got and, and the way I looked at it is if we kept them up brilliant you know no one would have ever expected that and if, if we didn't keep them up you know no one's expecting it, us to get out of it anyway so it was a kind of a free run at it um and you know we got we got some decent results we, we beat hartley at home we ended up going down and a way to let uh, loot and we got a, a really good draw so you know you're just looking at those and just pitting your wits against other teams and trying to outdo them it was really i, I found it fascinating tactically and also but we had a lot of trouble with you know players just refusing to play and um, you know pfa were involved and everything else so it was a little bit of crisis but i enjoyed it mm, it gave you a, a good a good taste of, of, of what to come Maybe we'll talk about Longford Town and how that came around in a minute. I'd like to just take a little bit back to, I suppose, your your early your early years. And when you were growing up then, was sport and football that ultimate goal for you to become a professional? Yeah, I think um, not sport, just football. I, I, I didn't like any other sport. Uh, never watched any other sport. I suppose... When I was growing up, there wasn't that many. There wasn't that much sport on the telly, so it was it was it was mainly football. But I used to live near, you know, close enough to Tottenham's ground, and my dad took me to um, Tottenham matches, and we'd go we'd go and watch all of those at home matches anyway. And then when we was when when Tottenham were away, we'd go and watch uh, a non-league team called Enfield, who would be doing mm-hmm. quite well at the time as well. Um, so we'd be watching. I'd be alternating to, but Tottenham was my team. And just playing football out at the front, we used to call it. I used to live in like a little, little kind of an estate. We called it an estate. But it was like a kind of a cul-de-sac. We have a, we we sprayed a goal on one of the walls, and we play football out the front there all day. And that and that was what we used to do. Mm. So it's definitely always been the, the focus with, with with football as the the main point. Did, did um did you start to show natural talent early on? Was it? something that was spotted at a young age? So we would have, I would have just been, you know, nowadays they're, they're playing kind of football, organised football, under sevens, under eights, under nines. I didn't, I didn't play for a team until under 11s. So mm. um, that was my first kind of taste of 11 side organised football and, and did okay. Um, moved from one team to another team um, who would have been better in the league. So signed for that team and then Tottenham scouted me uh, uh, to go and train with them once a week, but there was loads. Of, there was there was a lot of lads. I suppose back in back in those days, it was kind of because I was local. They would just bring as many as they could. I suppose who, who showed a bit of talent, see what they got, and then just just managed to just to stay there. That's how I looked at it. You know, just managing to stay there. I, w- I wouldn't say I was exceptional. I wouldn't say I stood out. Didn't get in um, county team at the time, which would have been. Middlesex, I didn't get in that team, and, and and that was it really. So I was just happy just to be just being kept on at Spurs. Mm. And it gets to a stage where you're playing matches, kind of. You get to probably I think it's fifteen, and you're playing matches for Tottenham, and then they they, they decide whether they're going to take you on full time. Um, so by then, that's what that's really what I wanted to do. By the time I was sixteen, that's that's what I was desperate to do. Mm. Would you say you had a, a real kind of work ethic and a real focus and determination in those days, or were you kind of just taking it as it as it came along? No, I was I was I was really dedicated. I wouldn't say I was I wouldn't say I was um, dedicated in in like going out for long runs and gym. Mm. Not, not that kind of dedication, but just used to watch football, just absorb any type of football I could at the time. Always, whenever I had a spare minute, I would be practicing with a football. Just used to love playing football. That's, that's what I like doing. I, I didn't really like the, the other side of it, but I just used to love playing football. Mm. So one of the things I, I kind of talk a bit about when I kind of do coaching and and um, people development is is this idea of deliberate practice versus kind of free form play. And was that were you in more kind of free form play all the time and just in kind of almost game environments, or were you spending you know an hour every day? taking free kicks or taking corners or just focusing in on narrow parts of your game? No, I would just be play. Right. Play as much as I could. Um, 
out the front, just whenever with mates, just play, just play, play, play. But it was it was only then when you start getting when I started getting coached that I started learning the game a little bit better. That mm-hmm. would have been a, you know, I would have been coached. Don't get me wrong, I would have been coached, you know, through through my earlier years. But it was only when you go to Tottenham and you're getting actually coached about stuff, not overly coached, but you know, just coached about real football how real football is that you start kind of understanding it and I think it was then that I started um, probably becoming a little bit standing out a little bit more out of the group I was with when it when I you know that was when I started to think that you know I'm I'm first choice here because I can do this stuff and they can't mm. and did you find that's how that, I felt did, did, did that come easy though do you, or was it do you think through the extreme effort that you were putting in you know, you might be looking around in that group, and other guys might be trying as hard as you, if not harder, but not just making that grade. Was it just something that was coming easier for you? Yeah, it was coming. It was coming. I just felt that what the type of player I was, it was all about how how my touch was and how you know I could finish and everything else that a, that a striker would be at the, the time that they wanted from me, and I managed to be able to do that better than better than the other lads I, I don't know I wouldn't say I was a better player than them but what they were looking for is what I could do so that's how I felt about it there was other lads who could who could run faster than me could do stuff better than me but I could do at the time what Tottenham wanted me to do better than anyone else in my age group I felt mm. Was confidence a big thing for you in those days? Um, confidence was yeah I suppose that I, I've got confidence from playing well I, I never needed somebody to tell me that I'd played well I always knew it and I always knew if I didn't play well so it wasn't like I needed an arm around the shoulder my dad would always come to matches and I'd know you know earlier early if I played bad my dad wouldn't speak to me hmm. and but I didn't need him to I knew I knew I'd play bad and sometimes I just I, it just wasn't going for me and I'd just rather not be on the pitch but as you get older you learn to deal with that but I just, I just felt I, I always knew I didn't need anyone to tell me if I played well. I just knew I knew I knew from you get you pick up from the lads, the other lads, and you pick, you just know, don't you? You just know if you're playing well or not. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just thinking back to my days. I was under under fourteen, sixteen, eighteen with Longford Town uh, back in the day, and I, I guess when I was playing, I know now looking back that if the manager was was praising me or giving me positive vibes. I would play an awful lot more. I was a confidence player in that respect. Whereas if if I was getting a rollicking, I would just not play well. Um, and it was heavily influenced by what was coming from the manager. Um, probably just not really aware as as much as I would have been at the time. Um, but was that like your way? Was it all really down to you though? How you played, or or if if the manager was. Yeah. No, I always felt if I, I knew what I needed to do to play well, if I, you know, if the ball was bouncing off me, I knew I had to improve my touch. If, if I wasn't working hard enough, I knew I had to work harder. I didn't, I didn't need, I didn't need anybody to tell me. Um, you, as you get, as you, as you start playing in first teams, you can just hear the crowd, just sense the crowd, and you know. Then you know, you, you, I, I always knew what I needed to do to be better, or knew. And sometimes I just, there was times when I just couldn't, I just couldn't get going, or there were times when. I just yeah, the, I was just wasn't receiving the ball. The ball just wasn't coming to me. There was not a lot I could do about it. But most of the time, I knew if I if I was what I needed to do to play well. So I, I didn't really I didn't really care what anyone else was saying um, mm. to me. I just I knew in my head. Mm. That's why you met it and I didn't, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, so so when was the the big break? When when did you kind of step from? kind of on the fringes to to really feeling I've actually arrived here now so when, so, I let, so I got offered a two year apprenticeship at Spurs when I was 16 so I left school went straight into that and that was that was just that was relief more than anything because I I, I did I hated school I didn't have anything else to fall back on so that was that was it it was a it was a, it was a necessity that, that I got that that, um, that two year apprenticeship hmm. and when I was there I just I just loved it. I just thought this is what I want to do. I just used to love everything about it. Other lads used to moan about doing all the jobs and everything else that we had to do, sweeping up, cleaning, cleaning up. But I just saw it as part. If I, if I just did it, it'd help me be a professional footballer. So that that wasn't hard for me. That wasn't tough. 
I was living at home with my mum and dad, so I didn't have that pressure that right. the other lads had living in digs. I understood that, you know, that was tough for them, for a lot of them. Mm. I wasn't bored in terms of nothing to do with, a, with an evening like a lot of them, like some of them. Um, so that that wasn't that wasn't a problem for me. Um, so that I just, I just loved it. I totally absorbed everything. I used to love being around the first team pros. I used to love it whenever I got a chance to train with them, which wasn't that often at that age. Um, I used to love, I, I loved going to the matches and having the best tickets that you could get because we all got tickets. I, I, used to, I used to love everything about it, changing up, sweeping up the changing rooms after after matches, meeting the other opposition managers, just just all of that. Love all of it. And it wasn't. And it was only then, like you say, so you do your two year apprenticeship. And I did okay. I wouldn't say I did really well in the first year. It took me a while to get going because there was, there was two teams. So you had like a first year team and a second year team. Right. Tottenham did at the time. And it was only the second year where we got that I started scoring lots of goals. We got to the FA Youth Cup final. We got beaten by Manchester United in, in the final in penalties. So it wasn't kind of until the second year that I knew that I was doing well. I was I was like playing every week and scoring for that team playing the odd time in the reserves as well so I kind of knew that I was doing well but even then you're, you're, you're wondering whether you're going to get off at a pro deal because um, there was no agents for us at the time at, at, at Spurs so it was just where, where was I going to get a professional deal some of the lads already had pros after their, after their two year apprenticeship but I didn't so it was a little bit of a worry at the end of that was I going to get a pro was I going to get a pro and unfortunately I think I got a year's pro and um, and played in the in the reserves then. Right. That that kind of pressure, that worry, was it something you were? What was it impacting how you were playing? Were you able to park that? Was it, was that something you were able to deal with? No, I think it. I think it helped me. I think it was. It was. It was like if I didn't get that white, I wanted to stay there. I, I loved mm. it. So it was. I'll do anything I can to stay here. I'll play as well as I can. I'll work as hard as I can. Um, I've always got. I've always got that kind of laid back attitude a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know that I always thought that my, my I always used to say it anyway. I didn't know whether I thought it or not. Was that my ability on the ball would get me through rather than having to run laps and, and stuff like that. But you know, I know now that's not the case. But at the time, it, that's how I felt that I'd be able, I'd be okay because I was looking around. You know, you see other players, and don't get me wrong, other players have got different attributes, but no one was was doing what I was doing. Um, so. Yeah, just just really happy to get that year and determined to make it work. Mm. And do you remember during that period, as as you were kind of about to to break through, folks around you that had a big influence on you to to kind of help you stay focused to make that that leap forward? Is there any kind of conversation or piece of advice that was given to you to that that had an impact? Um, not really. I, I just used to. Um, not really there's not not one that stands out I know I used to get I used to the older pros I really used to look up to I used to, I used to listen to anything they said to me now whether I took it on, whether I, I did enough to take it on board I don't know but players like Les Ferdinand Gary Mabbert Teddy Sheringham just just players like that if they said anything to me I just wanted to listen to anything they said and you know I always used to look at the way they acted and how they behaved and I, I saw how other lads behaved who probably didn't make it and I just knew that from then that's how you that's how you have to act to be a professional whether or not whatever happens on the pitch just act like a professional off it that's what I tried to do mm. okay very good so you made your debut against United I think was it in 97 that obviously probably still uh, is is clear in your mind or, or or was it one of those things that just flashed past you very quickly how does how do you reflect back on that no, I, I wish I had. Be- I wish I had more memories. I've got slight memories. Of it. I wish I had more. Um, but I just remember. So I'd been involved in a couple of the a couple of the first team squads, but never never been on the bench. Mm. Um, but but playing in the reserves and doing well, so didn't feel out of place. Whenever I trained with the first team, I never felt out of place. And whenever I played in the reserves, did well, scored. I think I was the top scorer in the reserves that year. So I always I always knew. If I if I played, I, I would do okay. I didn't I didn't think I would be the best player in the game, but I always thought if I, if he gives me a chance here, I'll take it and I'll, I'll do okay. Um, so the so the morning of the match, so we travelled up and I'm looking around and there's a few injuries and I thought oh, I could make the bench here. I was trying to figure out the team and I was going look, I could definitely make the bench here. So 
as we as as he's Jerry Francis has read the team out, wherever it was, an hour and fifteen minutes before the game, and and my name just got read out to start, and I just I just couldn't believe it. I just didn't have a chance to really feel too nervous about it, mm. um, but just just I was worried. You know, would I? My main concern at the time was would I be fit enough to last the ninety minutes? Would I would I blow up after twenty minutes or or whatever? Because I knew the pace of it would be really quick and mm. and everything else. So that was my main worry. I, I wasn't too concerned about. Again, about you know when I got the ball or anything like that or, or whatever, but it was mainly would I last? Would I be able to last? But um, no, that was it. So yeah, that, uh, I remember. I remember the war. I remember quite a bit of the game. Obviously, I've seen it. I haven't watched it back in in years now, but I've mm. obviously watched it back a few times and thought I did okay. Could have done, could have done better, but thought I did okay. <laughs> And it's a it's a great one to to start the career off. It was um like that night after that week after you know did you did your feet get did you get carried away? Did uh, how did you keep your feet in the ground or did you think you've now arrived? No, I thought I, I thought that yeah I was getting a lot of feedback that you did well, you did okay. There was bits in the papers about one for the future and and everything else, but I knew that there was going to be lads back for the next game. So I wasn't even on the bench for the next game, which was which was very disappointing. Right. But in the meantime, I'd had like um, agents ringing me. First time I'd ever have an agent ring me, but this time I had about five or six ringing me. Wow. Ringing my mum's house at the time because there was no mobiles. So <laughs> it was, um, it was, it was very, um, yeah, it was, it was a little bit, you know, they're trying to throw boots at you and everything else. And because I was still on, I was still on my wages from my, I'd signed a second year pro, whatever it was, at two hundred pound a week at the time. So right. I was on that wages. So um, obviously they're saying to me, oh, you know, you can get a better deal than that if they cut them off you one." But that wasn't that wasn't what it was all about for me. I didn't care about that. It was it was. I just wanted to play in the first team for Spurs. Yeah, it's uh, it's probably a life changing moment at that time. You were only about twenty or so then, were you? Oh, I was I was I was nineteen, just turning 19. twenty. I, I think the debut was on the fifth, and I was making, uh, and I was. Um, twenty on the eighteenth, right. so just before my twentieth birthday. But yeah, you can you can say you can say it's a great place to start. But some people would look at it and say it can only go downhill. From there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, well, much uh, further it could go yeah. up for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but look, it it um it 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 kind of started to work out. Though you got a five year deal, um, and at that point, then you thought, I'm set. This is this is going to be great. Yeah, I, I remember having a conversation with Joey Francis when I signed it, and he said, "Look, what we'll do is we'll loan you out next season for a, to a championship team for the whole season, just to get your games, get you going." Because I think they'd signed um, Klinsman that year as well, and they had they still had a lot. Of, there was a load of strikers at the club at the time. I, I, I would have been definitely ones off the top of my head would have been Les Ferdinand, Teddy Sheringham, Stefan Everson, Chris Armstrong, and mm. Jurgen Klinsman. Now, whether they were all there at the same time, I can't remember, but Definitely around that period, those five would have been there. Plus Rory Allen, who would have who was in, who was ahead of me in the pecking order in terms of the young players, um, he was there as well. So it was definitely competition. So as you know, as long as I I was going to get games, I was going to sign for the Spurs. The Spurs wanted to keep me. That that's all I wanted to hear. Really, that that was that was fine by me. Mm. And when but you... at the end of that, the start of that season, I got injured. Mm. So I was out for the first three months of it. I, I, I hurt my ankle in a reserve game. I think it was the reserve, first reserve game of the season. So, obviously, that set me back a few months. Mm. And, and that's probably the first time in your life or footballing career that you were unable to play for a period of time. How did you? How did you deal with that? How did you keep focused? How did you like prevent yourself from going down different, maybe bad roads? Yeah, I think injury, injuries are tough to deal with. I, I, I'm not sure it, how it affects some people. It, it, it affected me um, not not that not that badly, to be honest. I just always, you know, it was just a routine. It was, it was instead of training, you do rehab, or instead of training, you you just get treatment. And the only the only difference is you're not playing matches. That that was hard to deal with. But I wouldn't say it was, you know, it sent me into any sort of spiraling kind of loss of hope or anything like that I was I was I was okay I knew I'd be all right it was just it was just for me it was just a matter of just getting back fit and taking it step by step really okay so it seems like you have that kind of a positive outlook anyway and 
from what I'm hearing, you know, it seems to to come to the fore. You, you didn't seem to take those knock knockbacks too too seriously, which is which is great. Yeah, I think if I if I didn't have, I suppose the five year contract helped. I suppose if my, my contract, yeah. well, even then, I, I still don't, I still don't think that it would have been. Um, I don't know. I've had injuries before and since, and you know, I've been a full time football. I was a full time footballer from when I was sixteen. So you get used to injuries. I did anyway. I got used to this part and parcel of the game. You know, sometimes they take longer than others to heal. But you know, it, 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 I don't know. It's just something I, I could deal with it fine. Mm. And it was around this time, I suppose, you were getting more and more involved in in the Irish setup as well. Was that always the the way you wanted to go? You wanted to play for Ireland as opposed to, to England. Um, not re- not really. I, I didn't really. Where I grew up in London, we, there was there was loads of there was loads of cultures different. Like I said, my my, my friend Omer was Turkish. Yep. We had we had Jamaicans, we had um, Nigerians, we had um, other just just a load of nationalities in one place. And it was never a case of oh, I'm desperate to play for England. I'm desperate to play for for Ireland. It was it was for me. It was always Tottenham. Right. That that was it. If I played for Tottenham, that would that would do me. And it was while I was playing for Tottenham at under. 15s, I think it was at the time, or 16s, that Ireland said, "You want to come and play for us?" And and it, it, that was it. I said, "Yeah." It was it was kind of a it was a no brainer, really. It wasn't. Oh, hang on, I'm going to wait to see if England want me or anything like that. It was yeah. yeah. Um, it's just it's another it's another bit of recognition for me. It, it's another chance that we ended up playing in the Euros in, in Turkey that in ninety whatever it was four or two or whatever it was so mm. ended up going there and, and that was it I was I was playing for Ireland from, from then and I was Irish from then Excellent v- very good so so just maybe in the next few years of your career you've you know didn't maybe break through in Tottenham and then started to go to different clubs on loan and, and different spells what was that journey like even just is there anything that stands out is there is there any regret yeah, there's loads. There's loads of regrets for me. Um, I always felt that I, I could have done a lot better. I, I felt there was, a, there was a few low moves that, that, that were not suitable, that were not right for me, um, and that probably I I didn't really take them that seriously when I went there. I didn't really put my heart and soul into playing for them teams. Cause I knew it was a loan, and I knew I didn't really want to sign for them anyway. So I think there was one. There was I, I went on loan to Lincoln. I can't remember what year it was actually. It was during the five year contract I had at Spurs where I went to Lincoln and I told Tottenham at the time I didn't think it was the right place to go I just didn't I, I, I didn't think I'd be you know suitable for them and, and, and they said look you're going there's you and another lad are going to go a lad called Pete again um, me and him went up there and, and we, we just they never played us we kind of just sat um, just kind of just not playing at all not enjoying it there whatsoever um, so that was just that was that was another kind of three or four months wasted, and that's how I felt the last couple of years at Tottenham, or, or the last two or three years at Tottenham, were just wasted waste of time. Really, it was it was twenty four by the time I'd left, by the time I left Spurs mm. um, to go to Peterborough, and by then I'd, I'd only played like a handful of matches, and you know, twenty four year old play, not only playing a handful of matches, you, you haven't got a, a chance really. I don't think. Mm. But you managed to keep positive and look at the Peterborough experience as, as something, a new challenge, a fresh start? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, there's a, kind, there's a kind of, when you're a footballer and you've got, there's kind of, I suppose, nothing else you, you can do. You have to, don't you? It's like a job. Mm. You start treating it, you start treating it as a job pretty early on. I, I, do, I did anyway. And as a footballer, I think you have to. If it's your job, it's your full-time job, you've got to do whatever it is keep the money coming in or to keep yourself available to work so that was it I I, I play I um, Barry Fry phoned me and said do you want to come to Peterborough I, I didn't have any other options to be honest Barry had obviously seen me playing somewhere along the line for Spurs and, and like we saw and I think Tim Sherwood at the time had recommended him recommend, re- recommended me to him um, so I went there because I'd, I'd become a kind of training ground footballer I was just good at everything in the training ground but I hadn't actually played any matches, right. many matches over the last year. So like, I think it was George Graham at the time was the manager, just completely for I wasn't even playing reserve matches or anything. I just wasn't playing any matches whatsoever. So I was just good at everything in the training ground, little possession games and stuff like that. Um, so it was a chance to get out. The contract had run out anyway, so I had to go somewhere. 
Um, I went to Peterborough, signed a deal there for just a one-year deal, but it was a, it was a new start, and I was determined I was going to give it a good go, and ended up doing okay in the first year, um, and got got an extension for another another two years. So um, I was happy with that, and enjoyed the first the first year at Peterborough. Just conscious when you mentioned football just became a job, right, and it was work. Did, and did the love of it go? In those days, or, or or was was it like any any passion you follow when it becomes your nine to five or whatever? Does that passion diminish a little bit? How did you find that? I think the the, the love of the love of football is always there, like, but the the love of there's it's not just football you you have to do. You have to do other stuff as well. You have to do you know running. Yeah, you, know, you have to be. Sometimes you're getting told to do stuff by a manager or a coach just to annoy you because they want you out of the club or whatever. Right. Now, I didn't have that too much, to be honest. I didn't, have that. I didn't have loads of that. I don't think anybody treated me too badly. I know other lads would have had it. But for me, it was... Um, they, they, it, you, just become, you just become sick of probably where you are in a situation you're in rather than football. I never lost a love of football. So you are, you're kind of sick of God, I'm training again, not getting, not getting picked for matches. I'm better than him. He's getting picked, you know. So you know you do, you do get that situation definitely. Mm. Conscious as well that during those years when when you were maybe not playing for Spurs, and the mental side of the game is very important as well as the physical. Was there anything in place to for you to kind of talk to people about? This is tough. I'm not finding a breakthrough here. To you know again to kind of keep motivation high and and keep positivity there. Um. Not that I'm not that I know of. I don't think there was a there was a psychologist, sports psychologist at Spurs at the time that, that that could give you that. But to be honest, I don't think I would have gone to him anyway. Right. I, I don't think I needed it. I had I had mates, I had parents that I would be I, I would talk to them, talk to talk to people openly about how I, you know the situation I was in, and you know some people would say, "Listen, you're getting paid. What are you doing? You're working two hours a day." Get on with it. Stop moaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other people, other footballers would say, "Listen, you got to get out. You got to get away." Which is sometimes easier said than done. And other people would just say, "Look, keep your head down and wait to see the end of your contract." So I kind of knew it all. I did. I'm not saying I knew it all. That sounds wrong, but I kind of, I didn't need it to be honest. I did not need it. I, I was, I knew the situation I was in. Um, I knew if I was a manager and I want, uh, I didn't fancy a player, I'd, I'd probably do the same. So I understood that part of it. I understood that football's a business, and you know, if you've got players that are not involved or not, not. Not um, not playing for you. Don't too many your plans, and you're going to try and freeze them out. It was, there was there was no. It's nothing personal. It was just it was just the way football is. Mm. Okay, very good. So so when you came to the League of Ireland, was was that something that uh, obviously maybe was never expected? Was it a big big move? Was it something that you had to consider heavily? Yeah, because I'd, I'd left I'd left Peterborough um, at the start of the season. Because I thought I was going somewhere else and it didn't work out, so I was kind of in limbo a little bit. Right. And um, Dan Connor was the goalkeeper at Watford at the time, and he had been at Peterborough with me. So we were just texting one day, and he says, "Look, would you fancy coming over here? It's a summer season, so just see it till the end of the season, see what you make of it." So um, I, I kind of I said to the, the, the missus at the time, "You know, what do you think?" And she said, "Well, what's she going to do?" I'd kind of got a little bit disillusioned with football in England. So I said, like, it's a new start. I'll give it a go. So I came over there and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I, I kind of knew a lot of the players, not a lot of the players, but I knew a few players from 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 my Irish teams who were playing in the league anyway. So, for example, like Thomas Morgan, Trevor Malloy, mm. they were players who would have been, Colin Hawkins, would have been in my Irish team when we, when we played in Malaysia. They would have been there. Yeah. So I kind of knew that they were playing in the League of Ireland, so the standard couldn't be couldn't be too bad. It wouldn't be far off League One, where it, which was the last league I was in with, with Peter. So I was happy enough to um, happy enough to, to to move over and, and see how it went. Hmm. And, you, and I really enjoyed it. It was really good. Yeah, for for the the number of years you played, I, I think I read you you won the league with three different clubs. I think that's a, a record at the moment. Still, is it? I've no idea. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you could probably you could probably couldn't class. Me at Shamrock Rovers winning the league with it. I know they did win the league and I was there, but okay. I don't think I played that many times. But yeah, I, I had a really good, really good career in Ireland. Really enjoyed it. Enjoyed the football. Enjoyed all the people there. Really liked it. The, the, the Cork experience, obviously, where I am now living in Cork, um, 
Cork City doing very well. You certainly had a, a very good t- stint with, with Cork. Yeah, cause I, I suppose I always had the connection. My mum's from Cork, so yeah. I, had a, I had a connection where I used to go there every year on holiday. Um, so we had that, um, I had that connection to Cork. So when I was leaving Waterford at the time, um, I, could, I, had a, I had a choice of a few clubs, but Pat Dolan at the time would, would be the one who was really pushing me. He'd come and come to Waterford to speak to me, and he seemed the most keen to sign me. So I thought, Do you know what, if he's, if he's that, if he's putting that much effort in, then then I'll sign for him. So and I signed a three year contract at Cork and, and really enjoyed my three years there. Really enjoyed, loved, loved living in Cork, loved the people, loved the area, everything about it. Yeah, no, I agree. It's uh, it's definitely a great place to to be in. Um, and then I suppose I know we're moving through your story, and I, I do want to spend a bit of time talking about you right now as a manager. But at, at the age of thirty three, you you decided to hang up the boots. Was was that a difficult decision? And had you put much thought into what you would do straight after? Um. So I I got to kind of got to got to left left bowls in two thousand and nine. And, and di- didn't think I was leaving on my terms. Just didn't get offered a new contract there. And I always thought, you know, if I ever I was going to quit, it was going to be on my terms. And I was a little bit kind of, you know, what am I going to do now? And, and the offers weren't exactly rolling in, to be honest. I was mm. I was 32 and I still thought I had a lot to offer, but just the offers weren't rolling in. So I did the PFI training camp, which was the first one of the, that, that year, of, of the first time I'd ever run it. And I did that and, and, and ended up signing for Dundalk, which was... You know, which was good. I enjoyed the first couple of months there. It was just it was a bit of a bit of a trek away from my house, and we were we were kind of we were training on Astro every day, which was which was really hurting my back at the time. And mm. you, you kind of you get knocked out of the of a, of a cup, and you get you you know you're not going to win the league. And we was in Europe for a bit, and we got knocked out of that. You can't. I was I was looking at it going, if I just jack it in now, I can. Um, I could start. I was, I was trying to start a coaching business, um, like a strikers, just coach focusing on strikers. So I was trying to do that, and then, but but the Dundalk training and, and the travelling, everything was getting a little bit too much. So I thought if I just quit now, halfway through the season, I could just concentrate on that. Um, I could get my tax back, which was which was a you know which was a, a payment that players get once they retire. So all that factors were kind of leading me towards this. Just, just knock it on the head now. Um, you're in pain all the time just get, you know see what happens and try and get it up and running and so and that was it so I told Dundalk that I was going to retire and and um, and that was that and then the old story of Shamrock Rovers came in a couple of days later and asked me did I want to sign for them and I kind of said look I can't I've retired and blah 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 and, and spoke it over with a few people and ended up thinking that maybe I'd retired a little bit too soon and maybe I should give it till the end of the season with Shamrock Rovers um, and see what happens there and, and that was it and then once I'd left Shamrock Rovers once that season had finished that was me I knew I was done and um, I could concentrate on coaching Okay and the, the so the, the coaching business was something you were very focused on I suppose what was your your vision or, or plan with that was that going to be taking up your full time yeah, I was going to do that full time. It was going to be. I was just going to try and make that work and try and, you know, st- still, st- you know, coaching kids, not adults, just coaching kids, and and try and get, try and get the enjoyment back that that I used to get from playing football to to to, to give young kids. That was the plan, and um, that was it. I did that for a, for a good few years. Yeah, that was enjoyable. Very good. So maybe we'll take it up to the post um, Leighton Orient experience once once that. This was whetted your appetite for for management. It was pretty sh- pretty quickly after that you you applied for the Longford Town job. Yeah, it was straight away. I come back in the summer and just said, you know, speaking to my wife and just said, like, I just want to be. I fancy the manager now. I just want to. I want to give it a go. Um, and that was it. Looked online actually and just saw that, or someone might have shown me a link or sent me a link of Longford looking for a manager. Um, and that was it. Applied for it, did a couple of interviews, and, and luckily got a job. When I was thinking about doing, uh, putting some questions together, th- that the interview process, like, was this the first interview you've ever really done? Was it, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, exactly. How did you prepare for that? I phoned a few people who who, who I know would have been through <coughs> the interview process. I, I phoned a couple who I knew would have been interviewing people, like football people. 
uh, and the kind of questions they'd ask me, you know, how to, you know, what to bring, what to prepare. Yeah, definitely. I was, I was, I was totally going into it. It was my first ever interview. Yeah. So, but I had the confidence that I kind of, I had the confidence that I would be able to get my ideas across, whether or not I'd be able to answer all the questions they had about budgets and stuff like that, which I probably didn't know. But in terms of, um, what I, my ideas I had and my experiences and how I thought I could make a difference. I definitely, um, I was confident about that. Yeah. Confidence and I suppose passion for, for what it would, 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 would definitely be important. And did, did you go in with a PowerPoint presentation or was it very much kind of just you no, talking? I went in, no, I went in with a kind of folder prepared. I wasn't sure whether there'd be, um, facilities for PowerPoint. Like we'd, we'd, I'd, I'd done my A license. So I was, okay. you know, we'd, we'd learned a lot about PowerPoints and stuff like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't that it was, I went in with a folder of, of stuff that, you know, how I saw the club going, um, obviously targets, um, ambitions, my staff, you know, everything like that. And, and, um, luckily for me, they liked what they saw. Very good. And in the A license training and did, did they kind of, is there a module on preparing for yeah. a job interview? Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. So it's quite. They, there's preparing your CV and then, yeah, because by the time you get to your A license, it's, it's, you're now looking at, you're now looking at lads who are going to be, you know, looking for jobs and trying to get the, you know, the main job. So it was, um, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was well prepared, but I was prepared. Okay, v- very good. And once once you did that, how quickly after that did you learn you got the the position? Oh, it was a bit. It was it was definitely a slow process. I say it to him now. Uh, what you waiting for? But um, it was it was it was a good a good month maybe from the first interview um, to me actually being announced. Maybe maybe three weeks, but it was it seemed like forever. Cause <laughs> I was hearing I was hearing from from certain people that I'd got the job and I was getting the job. So it was just a matter of time. Like, weren't they going to give it to me then? Mm. You know what they're waiting for. So, but I think they were just making sure that um, they were making the right decision at the time. Obviously, because I'd never managed before. Yeah, just uh, in the in the corporate world, three to four weeks is probably a short term, uh, short time. It can take months sometimes to get a job in in that 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 environment. So it's not so bad. Um, so so once you once you went into the the management role, your your first kind of role as 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 a head coach, head manager, had you developed your own i suppose leadership style did you know the type of manager you wanted to be maybe just talk to me about how you kind of started the, the job and, and I suppose some of the early impacts you had kind of set out to make um i suppose the, the first thing i wanted to do was was made sure that i put my style of play on on the team i thought that was the most important thing for me um was making sure that the, the, the kind of football the the lads were playing was the kind of football that I, I wanted and I, I liked to watch. So the first couple of sessions were you know, just based on that. Really, there was um, there was no big meetings about discipline or anything like that. Or, or, or you know, it was it was that would that would be for later because the first thing I wanted to do. I mean, I, I think we had I had like two sessions to prepare for the first match, and I wanted the first match to be exactly what I how I wanted to play. So. Definitely, for the first two sessions, we were focusing on style of play and and you know how I was going to get that across. And luckily for me, on the first game we played, I really felt that the boys are taking it on board and and we won the game. And um, yeah, it was it was it was good. I enjoyed it, and you know it was, it was the feedback I was getting from the crowd and the fans and everybody else was that that's the type of football they want to watch. So that was that was pleasing for me. Hmm, that's a great a great start. Uh, I guess as a as a manager, if you have very high standards and you you know you maybe see some of your your players not meeting that, is that something you're kind of able to to take a step back on knowing that maybe just because you could do it on the pitch doesn't mean a player can can execute what you're calling out. How, how do you balance that? I suppose level of standards. I always think when I, when I, especially players you've signed, if you if you don't ask them to do, I always think anyway. If you don't ask them to do something they can't do, then you know, I, I never ask a player to do something I don't think he can do. That's that's why I, I would never play someone up front who could, who couldn't play there or someone on the wing who, who who couldn't do what we are. So the kind of expectation level from players you only really get frustrated and you only really get 
annoyed with players when they're, when they're not doing what you've asked them to do. Really, that's the one I think. Anyway. Um, I would say to a player when I sign them that I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna play to your strengths, um, and I'm not gonna ask you to do anything that I don't think you can do. Mm. And, and your own philosophy as a manager or, or your approach, how did you develop that? Is that something you've been kind of working on for a period of time or did you kind of set out, you know, uh, some time to kind of write, really dig into this or did it naturally evolve? I think it was from definitely from the early years at Spurs. Um, Jose Ardila's era of the way he, he wanted to play, the way the, the players he had at the time at the Tottenham, Players I looked up to at Tottenham were the ball playing players, skillful, confident. Um, they're the type of players that I like. Um, going through watching watching Man United and then watching Barcelona under Guardiola, who I thought you know was exactly the type of football I wanted to see. You know, you see other teams and you think, okay, they're doing well, but they're not winning, or they're doing well, but you know, they're not playing total football. But I thought the Barcelona team. It, in, was it 09 or whatever that was exactly the team I wanted to be exactly how I would see a team playing so um, just kind of that's kind of moulded into a, now obviously I'm not I'm not um, stupid enough to know <laughs> to think that our players can play like that but that's I'll try and get as close to that as I can mm. Yeah, and, and, and is I suppose the challenge of sticking to that mentality and not, not bending when results aren't going your way how, do you, how have you dealt with that Oh, bend, you do have to bend. You definitely have to bend. I mean, there's, there's times when you can't play in pitches that are just not suitable for, for that type of football. Or, or there's times when the players take you sometimes too literally and, 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 and are happy to keep the ball and you can just sense that, you know, everybody's just, you know, they're, the, other, the opposition are happy for us to keep the ball more than us making them, sucking them out of areas. So there's times when you, you, you will have to kind of sacrifice it a little bit and play the longer ball or, or whatever, which we are happy to do as well. So it's trying to get the balance between, I, I'm trying to get the balance anyway, between good, exciting football, but also possession football, but also winning. Mm. There's a few things to balance there for, for sure. Um, so, so season two just finished fifth. I know there was times when we were knocking on the door to the top two and this was the, it, it, probably a roller coaster. What, what, when you look back and reflect on that and obviously prepare for, for this season, what are the key learnings you took on board as as, as a manager for, for that for, for for the year? I think definitely last year we we went out to try and win every game, and we would we would go out from minute one to win, and 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 every minute of the game we try and go and win. I think that that probably came from well, that obviously came from me. So I think this year um, there's there's times when you know we don't have to go out and win from the first minute. We don't have to we don't have to try and score every time we get the ball, every time we go forward. Um, we can try and let the opposition um, do something. I think it felt last year, teams would just be happy to sit in on us and wait for us to make a mistake, pounce, score, and then sit back in again. So sometimes I think we have to be a little bit more clever in, in the way we try and entice other teams out and make, let them try and do something and we catch them, which we didn't do a lot last year. Hmm. What what do you find the most difficult part of the role uh, as as manager that you maybe didn't expect? I think recruitment has been has been difficult. Um, I find that I find that um, not impossible, but re, you know, difficult. You're, you're 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 vying with other teams for the same the same players a lot of the time, and sometimes you just can't see the players' reasoning for going to another club or signing for another club instead of you or you know because it's not all about money um, it's not about money at this level so sometimes I think why and I just can't work it out but you have to get your head around that um, you know not having your own facilities not having your own training facilities working around um, people's jobs all those things because I would never part time in when yeah. I played so it was always getting trying to get your head around those things is is a little bit difficult, but um, yeah, that recruitment's the main one. Once you get your, once you get your recruitment right, right, then you should be you should be okay. Mm. I've interviewed a couple of um, football 
video analysts on the podcast over the last while and, and a rugby one not so long ago as well. How much do you use analysis or, or video analysis in, in preparation and other, I suppose, what are the other kind of tools or um, techniques that you're using to prepare for matches and to prepare for, for upcoming season? Yeah, so we watch your video probably once a week, um, just clips, not not a whole video. Never, I don't, I don't think. No, we've never watched a whole match. We haven't got the time really, but yeah. uh, just clips, clip, clip important things about what we did wrong, what, what we did, what we did well, and show them to the lads about you know how we're gonna, what we're gonna do for the next game, and and how we're gonna go out and approach the next game. So we do that once a week, and that that t- tends to. To have an impact, do you do you find that people take that on board well, and can you see it transfer to the to the pitch easily? Yeah, I think if it clips, I mean, I've, I would have seen videos before, and I, I always found they could be very boring if, if you if you let it drag on too long. And I don't think you can get the players' attention. So if I, I think that if you make the clips short, relevant, make the points you need to make without keep without sitting lads around for ages. Obviously, because we're part time as well, you haven't got the lads for ages, so. You know, you might only have an hour and a half slot to get your video analysis and your coaching in. So we 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 do it we do it nice, short and sharp. Try and get the boys, um, try and get them in, show them the video, and get them out onto the training pitch as quick as we can. Okay, very good. I'm conscious of time, Neil. I don't want to drag it on too much longer. There, I want to give you some time back, but uh, maybe just two quick ones to to wrap up. When you look at other leaders or other coaches, managers that. Uh, I suppose that inspire you. What what are the kind of qualities that you see that that you'd like to take on board yourself, and 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 who are they that you look to? So staying in Ireland, I would say that that Pat Dolan just would have had an unbelievable. I'll try and take bits from all of them, but Pat Dolan would have would have had an unbelievable unbelievable knowledge of every player. He knew everything that was going on in the whole league. He would have bits of gossip about people. He would have. You'd know every single thing about players. So I'll try and find out as much as I can about, about everybody. Um, then you'd have someone like Pat Fenlon who would just have... Pat Fenlon and, and Damian Richardson would have the determination and, and, you know, just wouldn't let anything else get in the way of their determination to win. So I'll try and get a little bit of that. Pat Fenlon would have been just the way he's, he was so professional about, about everything. Everything had, had to be bang on. Everything had to be right. So I'll get that a little bit from him. Michael O'Neill saw the game exactly how I saw it. When he would do my, when he would do video clips, I would just see that they were so relevant and so right that you know I just he he just saw the game how I saw it, and it was great working under him for a bit. So I try and take bits and pieces from from all from all the managers I work with over here. Mm. And, and would you reach out to these guys? looking for advice or bouncing ideas off? Do you have folks around you that you would like use as mentors? No, I, I still speak to, I see Pat, Pat Fenlon a little bit when we do a little bit of radio together. Um, so I, you know, bounce a few ideas off of him, ask him his opinion on stuff. Pat Dolan would always be, whenever I bump into him, would always, you know, give me a little bit of advice and stuff like that. I see Damien Richardson the odd time. So, um, yeah, it's just trying to, you have to be careful that you're not, you're not doing everything everyone tells you you've got to be your sure. own man as well so um, I take their advice I think you know definitely take it on board but make my own decision in the end, in the end. Mm, very good um, last one to wrap up I always ask uh, folks for a recommendation of, of maybe a book or, or something they've read or studied that has had an impact on how they make decisions or, or how they look at the, the world or, or the, certainly in your case maybe the, the football world Any, anything that you would recommend um, as a as a good book to read I suppose I've just finished reading or well not just finished I've finished it a while ago the, the Pochettino book um, Brave New World I think that's, that's for me it was just an eye opener to how he runs his ship really um, you know how he makes what how he makes decisions and why. I, th- I found it very insightful and also just kind of knowing the daily routine of it as well. You know how the, how the, how it would be if I was at a, a Premier League club, and that'd be a book that just just fresh in my memory, one that I would have read recently that I, that I enjoyed. Okay, very very good, brilliant. Just lastly, then is Pat uh, the 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 website Pat to Pro? Is that that's your coaching school? Is that still yeah. active? Yeah, yeah, that's still going. Yeah, we still run that. 
a little bit more difficult since I've since I've took the the Longford job because it's you know it's evenings and weekends as well, so it's a little bit of a balance. But yeah, it's still going. It's still going well. Okay, brilliant. I definitely wanted to give that a call out. Folks can check out the website pattopro dot com. Um, Neil, look, thanks so much for taking an hour out this morning. Uh, for me, it was very very interesting and enjoyable um, for, for, for multiple reasons and I'm really excited to, to share this out if anyone wants to get in touch or if, if they have any uh, comments or feedback how, how could they do that uh, with you Neil they can um, follow me on Twitter or give me a shout on Twitter it's Neil Fenn at Neil Fenn on Twitter um, LinkedIn I'm on LinkedIn Neil Fenn and um, Instagram very Thanks. good perfect Okay, Neil, I'll let you uh, get back to the day job. Thanks so much, and um, I shall certainly be in touch before releasing the show. Thanks, Rob. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Hey, guys, just before you go, I'd love to hear from you if anything specific stood out from that episode, something you might take away and try and implement in your own personal or professional life to help make you that little bit better on the other side is there anything you think i could do better to make the show even more enjoyable more impactful and maybe meaningful so drop me a note rob at rob of the green.ie or connect in on any of the social platforms at rob of the green we also have a community on facebook check that out if you're really enjoying the show maybe you could try and leave a rating or a review on itunes apple Podcasts app Go in there, give us a rating, let us know how we're doing. That'll help with the ranking of the podcast up those charts. The more folks that potentially see it because we're high up, the better. The more that might listen, that never heard of it before. And the goal of the show is to try and reach more and more people and have that impact more and more. So that's down to you. Please do help me with that. I'm not going down the route of hiring podcast promoters, quote unquote, from other parts of the world because they say they can help with the ranking and I don't really believe them or it's not very authentic. Help me do it in an authentic way. I'd really appreciate it. This year, I'm going more all in on Patreon. So it's three bucks a month. You can sign up, subscribe to Rob of the Green on Patreon.com. That will give you access to Patreon-only content. Nearly all the episodes of the 864 podcast are on there and new ones will be added only there. The 1% Better Show will have early releases there, but will still come out for free on robofthegreen.ie. There will also be live shows this year, some phone-in shows, extra content. Three euros a month will hopefully, the more folks that subscribe, allow me to do more and more stuff on there, add more and more content. At the end of the day, that's the price of a pair of socks, maybe, that you might lose, or a coffee. One way or the other, it's up to you. If you want to join, you'll still get free stuff otherwise but if you're enjoying what we're doing help us grow help us expand it i'd really appreciate that adding new stuff onto the website all the time there's an affiliates page under the be better drop down check in there there's training courses that you can sign up to more and more stuff will come in over time into season three now of this fun fun journey huge learning hopefully you're getting something from it too stick with it let's keep going enjoy the journey even more have a great day week weekend and thanks for checking it out good luck